the biggest change that I've seen, and I think it in some way is a precursor to the big climate challenges that will face us. Um, what's been really interesting just recently, I've been reading about you know, the next pandemic, which will really have to do more with industrial agriculture and the superbugs and antibiotic resistance. And that 80% of antibiotic use is in industrial agriculture and only 20% is for human. And I think that we have a lot of ways that we need to reimagine how we, we eat, how we farm, how we take care of other beings, sentient beings other than humans, i.e. the animals that we're eating, and really think about how this global pandemic is actually awakening us to the fragility of what's happening. And um, especially, I would say, on the, the food security, um, issues are finding that one in five people are food insecure and how are we going to address that um, as we come to terms with the fact that we have these interconnected systems that we rely on and um, so i think that there is a global awakening i hope we take the path to better cooperation and collaboration um, and i think along with that there'll be much more sort of focus on uh, regionalized food systems and regionalized economy um, so I think you're going to see sort of a dialectic of both, but um, I'm hoping that it will continue to be an awakening and people will not pretend to be asleep when we come back to sort of a new normal. Do you think there is going to be an, a normal, like are things going to go back to normal? Everybody keeps saying, you know, I'm sick of this. This is frustrating. You know, I, I, I want things to go back to the way they were. Do you think there's going to be a normal? Well, I think if you look at what's happening in other countries, there has been a return to sort of a normal. Um, I think innovation will be such that we will have new ways of doing things that will try to bring us back to what was normal. But I don't think there's going to be the same normal. I think there'll be, you know, different ways that we're going to be working. I mean, we're all in this virtual community now, which is phenomenal. So sort of looking at innovation in terms of technology and Zoom and ways that we can gather and not have to travel via airplanes. And so I think there's going to be different ways that we will connect. Um, and I'm hoping that we will not go back to a, a normal because that will not move us toward where we need to be in terms of facing the other challenges, uh, especially climate change. Absolutely. Thank right. you, Sue. Yeah. Thank you, so I really like your answers. And also it's an interactive dialogue with uh, Susan Rockefeller. So if any of us want to ask us two questions, we encourage you to put your questions into the drop box or you can raise your hand. So Jacqueline and I will try our best to make sure Sue has the opportunity to answer your questions. So Sue, our next question for you is, when you spoke at our International Women's Day event, you spoke about your mermaid moment because not everyone attended our International Women's Day events. What do you mean by this? And why is this so important to you? So I, I made a film, it really sort of harkens back to a film I made called Mission of Mermaids, A Love Letter to the Ocean. And I likened the, the myth of the mermaid to ocean health. And I came up with the three R's, which are rest, rejuvenate, and reimagine. So the idea is that if you let the oceans rest, you know, give them, you know, whether it's enforcing fishing regulations or minimizing bycatch or protecting fish habitat, they can rejuvenate and come back. Um, and it's the same with people. And I think that all of us, especially women, need time to rest from our busy schedules. And it doesn't have to be a long rest. It could be taking the practice of breathing, a spiritual practice, some self-care. But in all across the world, there is myths of the mermaid. And so, so for those of you that don't know, like I'll give like the quick synopsis. It's the mermaid falls in love with a man, loses her tail, you know, gets married, has a couple of kids, and all she asks is to have some sacred time to herself that's just uninterrupted. And her husband gets jealous and spies on her, and then their love is lost forever. So the idea is that we all need this sacred time, this time to ourselves to just be able to think and reimagine what our lives can look like. And I think it's so important. And you look at what's happening with this pandemic, 
we've all been stilled profoundly and there's been a resurgence of rewilding of animals in places where they haven't seen them before, clear, cleaner skies and cleaner water. So I think that the earth is so resilient and it can rejuvenate if we actually um, create ways that that can happen. So that's sort of the myth of the mermaid and it's the mermaid moment. And I, I believe we all need that because when we actually still ourselves and listen to what I call our heart song or the inklings of your heart, you're able to sort of figure out what your truth is and what and where you want to go in this life that is so precious. I love that, Sue. I absolutely love that. You are a true mermaid. I know your, your deep connection to the ocean and to the nature and Mother Earth. And I think that's a beautiful explanation. And speaking of inspiration, it's, a, it's quite a challenging time right now um, to stay motivated and to stay positive when there's so much unknown and uncertainty and pressure and anxiety. So who or what inspires you these days? Are you reading any certain books or podcasts or where are you turning to to renew that source of inspiration for yourself? So this time, has been, it's been very special because we are upstate in the Hudson Valley and I am with my husband, my two children, and my 85-year-old mother. And the silver lining is that I never would have had this time to be with them, ever. You know, we're all busy and in our lives. So inspiration is coming from just being with family. Not that it's all perfect, but being with family. And also taking the time to actually be in one place. So we have been listening to incredible bird song, and we've watched, we've been here for two months, so watching the fields turn green, we've got you know, a farm here, so we're meeting with the farm manager and learning more about the crops. Um, so inspiration is clearly coming from nature. I've had more time to actually dream and think about some of the things that I wanna be doing. Um, writing more, working on a, a short film. I'm in my art studio doing encaustic painting. Um, so my creative juices are very alive right now. And also we have bees, so we are working on a label for our bee honey, and also looking more into plants as medicine and plants for healing. So I'm working on a little neck roller, um, which will help with reducing neck pain and inflammation and working with a chemist to do an organic product that is more aromatherapy, but also has uh, medicinal um, benefits as well. And in terms of reading, uh, I've had, I've read some great books and I would love to do an exchange on if anyone has any books that they want to share. Um, I read a great book called The Art of Doing Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, a Stanford professor that talks about sort of, it's not about doing nothing, but it's about actually getting off of our devices and actually paying attention to where we are in our bioregion and looking at what's just right. If you're in the city, what are the trees around you? Looking at the architecture, just paying more attention to the places where we live and what we can learn from them. Um, so I've been reading a lot of books. Um, I could continue on that and then I can talk about the people that are inspiring me in terms of you know what I've been reading so I'd just love let me that. know. <laughs> Tell us who, who is inspiring you yeah. these days. So most I'd say the most inspirational project that I've been involved with is the project that Dan Barber and Jack Algier at Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture have started called Resourced. And what they found is that 30% of the regenerative organic farms will go out of business if they don't figure out markets because normally these farms are supplying their produce and their animals, whatever, to restaurants. That's not happening anymore. So, you know, the past 20 to 30 years of creating this regionalized food system is at risk unless we figure out ways to market in a new and creative way. So they've created these amazing food boxes that are use, utilizing a lot of the produce and the fish from artisanal fishermen and packaging them and making it available. So it's like a community supported agriculture, but it's actually a beautiful box, beautifully designed with educational Instagram. materials. Yeah. 
beautiful. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and hopefully that will be sort of a stopgap to make sure that we can ensure that these farms are able to stay afloat. So that really inspires me. They were able to pivot really quickly. The Blue Hill restaurants, you know, had to close as all the other restaurants had to. And how could they sort of pivot and, and actually help these farms that they've relied on for so many years? So I find that incredibly inspiring that um, they're doing that. And they've also come up with this garden in a box. So they take the idea of a recipe and they're giving a recipe for people to create their own gardens. And I think that is just a great thing to do during this time, whether it's, a, it's in, a, in a pot, you know, if you're in the city or a window box or taking a little piece of your lawn and ripping it up to make a garden. Um, and I think all those things when you get involved in helping people and giving back or giving to those regional economies that really are relying on us, um, but actually making it work and they've come up with a system. So that has been truly inspiring for me. Yeah, totally. Every time I see the beautiful and the gourmet food you posted on your Instagram, I was like, can I order from them? <laughs> <laughs> the garden recipe, can I have it from yeah. them? <laughs> well, you definitely can. And they're also um, providing food to the uh, many of the children in Westchester that are food insecure as well as hospitals. So oh. it's just a great initiative. And it makes me feel like there's a way that you can give back and actually help support these farms that are so much a part of the solution in terms of climate change and carbon sequestration and you know, really helping to support organic regenerative agriculture. So that's been extremely inspiring for me. Totally, yeah. Um, I think when we send out the recap email, we can include the farm's information uh, in the email. Yeah, and also like uh, that's a brilliant idea you're working on the Nike roller. Can you keep us updated when you launch it? Because I'm pretty sure Absolutely. so many Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it'll be for, you know, just a small little neck roller, but aromatherapy and just right on your neck and you can put it in your purse and it'll be really fantastic. And, um, and then the, I'd say one other book and an inspirational thinker is Reverend uh, Galen Gingrich, who is the senior minister at the All Souls Unitarian Church, and he has a book that's coming out this week called The Way of Gratitude. And I feel like your whole community lives in that sort of uh, space of gratitude and spirituality. And he talks about the practice of gratitude as a spiritual one. Um, and it's just very beautiful. The, the story is great. And um, so that in the being able to face the difficulties that we're facing, the fact that there's so much unrest and so much suffering, to not ignore it, but sort of face it with love and compassion and find ways that you can actually make a difference in each day that you're given. And I think that's really important as we think about resilience and how do you rise to resilience. And I think it starts with gratitude and knowing that we're here and we're, we're lucky to be here and and what is the possibility of each day? What can we do to make a difference? Totally. Absolutely. Love it, yeah. And I think we can also include the book information when we send out the recap email. And also tell us more about your work at Musings because I really like your digital magazine. And uh, we have some small business and female entrepreneurs here who actually own uh, business and product that is uh, eco-friendly, toxin-free, and very purpose-driven. So that would be great for us to get to know your work at Musings. You know, it'd be great to look at how we can collaborate. We have um, we have different partners, and the idea that the reason why I wanted to do this magazine was that I felt that I wasn't getting into my inbox something that I wanted, which was something twice monthly that would speak about innovation and entrepreneurship and ways of addressing how to make a difference in a way that was, was about responsible innovation and also ideas and inspiration for a better world. Like just, you know, I read about these entrepreneurs and they're young and, you know, the fact is that you all are the youth and you are taking on a lot of these problems. And, I find it extremely exciting when I find that most of these people that I'm profiling are your age. They are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and they are 
making a difference. Um, so we have nonprofit partners that actually vet the companies. We have Parsons School of Design, we have Food System 6, we have We Are Family Foundation, which is on global leaders, we have Manatry Partners, and we have Made Safe, which is looking at safe chemistry for the beauty in the home products. So every, you know, we love doing it. And I have a wonderful creative coordinator, Charlotte DeFazio, working with me and my daughter, <laughs> Annabelle. And it's just a great way to, um, what I call, it's like a ripple effect. So we put the newsletter out to about 10,000 people and then it reaches another 150,000 or so through the web um, affiliates. And then there's a lot of engagement that happens. And I'd love to find ways to participate with many of your female founders. I think that would be great. So if anybody here is a female founder working on a non-toxic, cruelty, vegan kind of product, how would they submit for you to review their product on Musings? So what they can do, a lot of companies will get in touch with us and they'll send us their products. And then if it depends on where they are. So if they want to be profiled on Musings, I want them to be in touch with Amy Ziff, who is the founder of Made Safe so that they can move toward made safe certification or at least be on that continuous improvement toward made safe certification. There's also other things we look at. We look at the packaging, we look at you know, how much plastic they're using. And then if they're not there yet, but we think they are a fantastic company that is moving toward made safe, I will either profile them on Susan Rockefeller on my account and talk about the product or the company and then encourage them to go to made safe and then they can be profiled on musings um, oh. and my account actually has more traffic but i don't i won't put um those companies on the the you know i won't do a profile that reaches ten thousand sort of influencers ceos and the global you know it's a global powerhouse of people that are actually getting that newsletter um, so you know i would say to anyone that's listening you know, send, like, send us an email, send me an email, and I can look at your website and have my daughter, Annabelle and, and Charlotte, and then I would most likely have them go meet with or get in touch with Amy Ziff at Made Safe, especially if it's a beauty or home product. Wonderful. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, we have yeah. Sundays here. So <laughs> my friend yeah. Amy, she's the founder of Sundays. So Sundays produces the best non-toxic uh, nail polish. They recently launched the candles. They also have clean tea. So yeah, it just- So we're actually going to do yeah, a you're profile doing a feature. on Sundays. Yes, we're yeah. getting their nail polish. We love, I, w I actually met them when uh, Hudson Yards opened and I thought it was such a wonderful idea. And the fact that it's non-toxic nail polish, we're very much looking forward to profiling because I think all, all of us want to be able to, to do our nails and have you know, nail care and feel like we're doing something that is good for ourselves and also for the planet. So um, they will be profiled. Wonderful. Oh, and we'll, yeah, see, we'll send you a, a list over, Sue, of some fabulous founders and products that could be a good fit for Musings. And everybody, if you're interested in learning more, we dropped the Musings website directly in our chat box. And Sue, kind of tailgating off of Musings and everything you have accomplished with this online magazine, I'm not sure if many people know this, but you are also a fabulous documentary filmmaker. And I'd love to ask you, why is the medium of film so important to storytelling? And what projects can you share with us that you are most excited about that you're currently working on or involved with in the film world? So I would say, you know, we all love films, right? I mean, it's sort of what we do in our pastime when we want to sit down with a friend. Um, and I think the power of storytelling is just, it's one of the most artistic ways of collaborating with people. Um, you've got filmmakers, you've got cameramen, you've got, you know, lighting, you've got editing, you've got the storytelling. So there's so much that that goes into making a good film. And there's always sort of an infinite way that you can tell a story. So what I love about filmmaking, and I, I always say to the people that I work with that I will never show someone in a negative light. Like I look to find the soul and the beauty of the person and the story um, and not to do something that's sensational or, because um, I think there's too much of that and it ends up being sort of toxic. And so my, 
my hope is that in the films that I produce and direct, that it really is something that will inspire people um, and educate them. And it's usually issue oriented. So, you know, whether it's on Mission of Mermaids, on Ocean Health, on, uh, I did something called Striking a Chord, on music and healing with post-traumatic stress. <clears throat> um, I did a film called The Box Star Cafe on the collaborative aspects of making music. Um, and then Food for Thought, Food for Life, and many others. That was on the Food Revolution. Right now, I'm, I'm part of a film company called Louverture Films, and we have a slate of really exciting films that are coming up. Um, if you go to the website, louvaturefilms.com, you can see the slate. Um, and we have one film that is that played in Berlin. It was at the Berlin Film Festival called Gunda by uh, Viktor Kozakowski, and it's a, it's a black and white film with no there's just no soundtrack except the sounds of animals. So it's the story of a pig, a chicken, and cows. And it's about using the tool of storytelling to create empathy. So I think that is the crux of why I love film, is that it moves people to being more empathetic toward others and all sentient beings, depending on what the film is. That's one film I'm very excited about. Um, and then I'm working on a film right now that's really more on, it's a personal film and a short film, which is looking at sort of how do we move beyond this consumptive mentality to move from consumers to creatives. And I really believe that this transformation that needs to happen will be very, very painful for a lot of people. There needs to be a massive restructuring of the way our systems work globally and in order to bring on more balance and more equity. So this is a short film talking about using the sort of imaginative, imaginative powers of being a child, that child wonder of connectedness and the need for all of us to go back to that place of understanding, um, which is really sort of spirituality to then move ahead and find a, a moral and spiritual compass so that children that are going to grow up into being leaders and also leaders lead with the spirituality and the morality that can really um, help solve these challenges. So I think filmmaking is art, it's storytelling, and it's also um, the ability to really change the hearts and minds of so many people um, through the medium itself. I love that. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. Thank you. So love your work. Speaking of filmmaking and creativity and connectivity, we have Asky here who produced our International Women's Day event video and she just asked us a question. Asky, you want to ask Susan this question yourself? We're actually producing a documentary, very short documentary with Asky. Uh, for residents to rise. So that's a perfect opportunity for you to ask Sue this question yourself. Yes, so um, during this time, it's so hard for me to keep up with the games because sometimes I feel so energetic and sometimes I feel so anxious. I just wanna learn, do you think we should take it easy this time because new normal will be different? I'm always trying to learn new digital things, but sometimes I feel like, I need to sit down and watch the world and then start doing everything. Well, I think maybe you could do both, you know? I think <laughs> it's the balance of being able to sort of take in this moment and, and it's a time of reflection. I think this is a time where people can really ask themselves like what are, what are their unique attributes that they want to contribute to the world? I think a lot of people in the millennial generation like I know from my daughter many of her friends have lost their jobs and she's done with her job on May 31st um, so I think there's a lot of, of sort of questioning and uncertainty um, but I do think it's a good time to think about what skills you want to learn like I know you know I think summer you're doing work on um, TikTok and learning TikTok and <laughs> Uh, so is my daughter. She now has a following on TikTok. And I think that there, there are new ways of learning things. And this is the time to maybe, you know, hone in on those skills. So, um, so I would say it's a combination, like, like keep learning and, and, you know, identify what the skills are that you want to learn 
but also give yourself the time to reflect on the things that you want to be doing and um, and sort of balance that. And I hope that's a good answer to your question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm still finding, I'm still trying to find the balance and hopefully I will. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Yeah. I was also going to say that I don't really believe, I said this at International Women's Day, I don't really believe that balance exists. <laughs> That and you no kind balance. of go back and forth and you kind of know when you're a little bit off balance and you need that time to sort of, you know, take those mermaid moments or whatever. But I, I think that that whole notion of finding balance is not, uh, when you have passions, I don't think it necessarily uh, works to think about creating balance. Uh, I think it's a, it's sort of an ideal that I don't know too many people um, who have achieved it. So I guess I'm just saying be a little wary of like trying to find perfect balance, but there's that balance between learning, reflecting, and working um, that you have to come to. And, and it's really what you'll know it. You know, nobody can tell you. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you, Sue. And, and speaking of, you know, that, it, that internal knowing, this is a question that I've been asking everybody that I speak to. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, we all want to know what have you learned personally about yourself throughout this whole pandemic? Like what has fundamentally changed within you since we have been under lockdown and in quarantine and in this new version of our world? Well, I would say that, you know, what keeps coming to mind for me is to just do less harm. It's like every day I wake up, it's just do less harm. Make choices that are better for me and for the planet, whether it's like more plant-based food, whether it's like loving more and um, being kinder to myself. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, in a sense, it's slowing down and having this family time. And I have this motto to protect what is precious and it's family, art, and nature. And I have to say, I have been really sort of blessed and affirming that, you know, I always say, find what's precious to you and work to protect it. And for me, it's, it's my family and sort of the global family through some of the philanthropy we do. And then it's art as a universal language and then nature, because if we don't protect nature, we will not be healthy. So I just think it's more of an affirmation and also permission to do more of the creative work that I've always wanted to do because I've been an artist all my life and now I'm saying, why am I waiting? I might as well just get into my studio and paint and I've been painting a lot and uh, my husband and I wrote some uh, haikus the other day and you know, so we're doing more poetry, we're writing more poetry, we're, we're reading more, I'm painting more, I'm more inspired to look at other artists' work. Um, so it's been a really, uh, I guess the learning is like relearning what I know is true for me. And I think that's um, what happens when you give yourself that time. Like this has been that moment of stillness for the world and for so many of us. And, and it's been sort of a, a reaffirmation of what I've always known, but now I'm saying just do it. Yes, totally. I'm the same. Like being three months under quarantine, I was like, we have to do something. Just do it. Exactly. <laughs> and I would say, yeah. Another question is that what through all of those has given you the most hope for our future and why? Well, you know, I am an optimist. So um, I really, I really believe in the, the fact that, you know, it's a little bit like you're resilience to rise, but I do feel like when there are major things happening, whether it's a pandemic or war, we, we rise out of the wreckage and we learn. And um, so I have hope for humanity. I mean, it goes back, you know, I kind of feel like we have so much that we need to, to do and you can find the people, your tribe, the people that can help you realize your dreams. And I think that's why um, it's so important that you've created this community. And I know Dee Dee McMahon is on the line and she's really in my tribe. We work with on ocean issues and we're working with Oceana. Um, that you find these people that you're on this journey with and, and all of you, like Jacqueline and, and 
Um, so I'm hopeful that, that people will find the people they need to move their mission forward. And I feel like when you have your mission, it can create a movement. And the most important thing is to follow what it is that's in your heart. Um, and I think if all of us take this moment to think, what is it that we need to do? Um, and what is most true for all of us, we can make a different world. And that's, I think, where the transformation happens. Um, so I'm hopeful and, um, and I hope other people are too. I mean, I know it's a very stressful time and we have huge structural inequalities in the world that need to be worked on. And I hope that each person finds what their God-given talents are and they just do what needs to be done because life is so short. Um, so I'm hopeful because I, I was born that way. Like I do feel like some people are born positive and some people are born more negative and there's a temperament issue. Um, but I, I tend to stay positive and the positivity also comes from seeing the beauty and the resilience of the nature around me of communities that rise like Feely and um, so many others that come out of the wreckage of a lot of destruction. Thank you, Sue. That's beautiful. You're, you're giving us a sense of hope and inspiration right now just by sharing these words. We really do appreciate it. Um, and as I gear up to ask you the next question, I really encourage everyone, this is a very special time. We're a very tight-knit group and community. So if you have questions, this is a safe space. You can type them in. If you don't want to ask them, Summer and I can ask them for you, or you can ask Susan yourself. So please feel free to share and interact and connect with us. So Susan, your commitment to the environment is truly remarkable, and you have done so much throughout all of your initiatives. So how can the Feely community, how can our tribe be doing more to curb the effects of climate change, even in the middle of a pandemic? What do you recommend we do to get involved and help? Well, I would say, you know, I'm just going to speak to the things that are most passionate to me right now, and, and we call it healthy soils and healthy seas. So, you know, if you think about, I mean, the one thing we can all do is, you know, we can make choices that count, right? So you can just, you know, there's a book called We Are the Weather by Jonathan Safran for, and it says, you know, we are the weather, climate change begins at breakfast. And it talks about the moral imperative to think about eating a more plant-based diet from a climate change standpoint, a health standpoint. So I feel like to be healthier and, and feel better and maybe more compassionate to all, you know, to the animals that we inhabit this earth with, to just eat more plant-based food. Like that would be one thing. Um, I would say that it's, uh, you know, the oceans feed over a billion people uh, a protein meal each day. So my hope, um, especially looking at sort of the overlays of climate change, that we have got to keep our oceans bountiful so that these people that rely on fish, especially in poor and vulnerable communities, have an abundant ocean. And if we, um, if we don't pres preserve or protect it, um, we will have more you know, land that will be cut down for industrial agriculture and then more climate change. So I feel like, uh, you know, this community can definitely sign up and become a wave maker. You know, it's free. Just go onto the Oceana.org website and then learn about what we're doing globally uh, to save this incredible ocean and the marine mammals and the sharks and the the fish as food. You know, one of our campaigns is to save the oceans and feed the world. And I feel all the more strongly that we have got to have a resilient ocean um, as we deal with, especially future pandemics that will relate to industrial agriculture. Totally. I love your answer. So speak of uh, your work in sustainability, um, global environment, climate change, ocean protection. We have to think about it from a global perspective. And we also have our fairly global community here. We have Naomi Dowling from um, Toronto. We have Asgi, her background is uh, Turkish. And we have um, 
Shelly, April, Amy, they're from China. So uh, you also do a lot of work in China and you and your husband actually go to China quite often before pandemic um, happened. And even like my high school classmates, we haven't spoke for a while, she reached out to me. She was like, Susan and her husband came to Beijing University and gave a talk. So your involvement in China is um, very strong. Can you tell us more about your work in China? Well, my husband and I have been going to China for the past 15 years. This will be the first fall that we will not be going back to Asia. We've decided to wait till 2021, um, given the pandemic. Um, and, you know, given the fact that the U.S. and China are superpowers and need to be working together, um, we work primarily through the lens of the Protect What is Precious. So we have been to China um, to do, well, we've shown my films. I showed the Food for Thought, Food for Life, the Mission of Mermaids. Um, we also um, go over, because my husband and now I have just joined the Asian Cultural Council. And the idea of this foundation is basically to create uh, mutual understanding through the arts. So we've had over 6,000 Asian artists come to the U.S. and it's a very high touch program where we, you know, assign them to a mentor and we put them into nice housing and um, we've created this incredible network of, of artists that actually go back to their communities and they become the head of choreography or famous artists or dancers or um, you know, curators. So it's been this, it's just an amazing way of building bridges. And we know that building bridges take time. And so I think through the arts as a universal language, it creates the sense of trust. And um, so our hope and our work is about building these bridges of trust, especially in different communities in Asia. So we, we go to China, the Philippines, and um, but primarily Japan and China are the two countries that we go to. And I love China. I mean, in terms of um, the innovation, you know, we have a lot to learn in terms of, you know, just the super app, the WeChat, and the different innovations that happen in China. And I was very proud to work on a, a design collaboration with Swarovski, where we worked with the Nature Conservancy to help with um, creating corridors between the national parks for the panda bear um, and looking at sort of that as a charismatic species that if you keep the panda bear healthy, then the other species, uh, you know, it's like the umbrella species, they're able to maintain um, their health as well. So um, we love going to China. We have great friends and colleagues there and um, pretty heartbroken about what's going on right now between the two countries. And, and we do believe that diplomacy and um, the arts and philanthropy and friendship is what um, will create a, a more robust and, and a more trusting future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, it, um, and it also means you have to go. Like, I think a lot of it is showing up. Like, you, okay. I feel like, you know, you have to go to China people come visit us, we, and it's all about building that trust and it's really beautiful. And, you know, the smart, I think some of the smartest people doing the most innovative work in health and the arts and technology, it's coming out of China and we have a lot to learn. And, you know, just looking at what's going on, the fragility of our supply chain, like just looking at fashion and what's happened with this COVID crisis and the manufacturing and, so I think it's a very interesting time to both, you know, acknowledge the interconnectedness and also find ways to heal uh, the connections that have been somewhat severed uh, given this uh, current political reality. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. and I thank you so much, Sue. Um, we have a few questions that are coming in now from our chat box. And I'm going to jump to Christy first. Christy Waldrop. Christy, would you like to ask Sue your question yourself? Let's see, Christy. Yeah, she's here. I'm gonna unmute you, Christy, are you here? Oh, 
Okay, I will ask it for Christy for now. Um, Sue, what are you excited um, about for the future of business moving forward out of quarantine? Well, I think that, you know, and I, I spoke about this when I gave a talk at the Fashion Innovation um, event a couple, I guess it was about a month ago, that I think that we will see a lot of innovation. And I liken sort of what happened with Alibaba with the SARS epidemic and that they became much more innovative and, and grew to 100,000 employees over sort of the innovation that happened during that time. Um, I think that we will be seeing more, I hope, more innovation in how we can come together um, virtually. Um, so I'm hoping that there's more like holographic opportunities or ways that we can kind of feel like we're more in the room together. And we saw a technology like that when we were in Seoul. Um, and I'm hoping that that kind of uh, somehow gets developed. You know, so I think that I'm hopeful that there'll be more opportunities for less travel and more connection in this way. And also just, you know, in a sense, you know, there's going to be much more digital innovation to connect uh, companies to consumers. So if companies are transparent and they can tell their customers or consumers, you know, sort of the um, history from like soil to shirt or the ingredients in their products, I think there's going to be more awareness of wanting what they call that authentic story, which I don't really like the word authentic because I feel like it sounds inauthentic at this point because so many <laughs> people use it. But I do feel like there's going to be more uh, interest in understanding where um, and how things are made and what's in your clothes, not, you know, just, just much more about sort of the intrinsic, intrinsic nature of how things are made, who made them, um, and more transparency overall. And I, I also it. think that there's going to be less you know, what they're showing, the trends, is that there's a lot of, you know, interest in um, people consuming things that have more to do with, with home life. So I think you're going to see more innovation with cooking and, and cooking, you know, whether it's blenders and, and cooked meals. And so I think there's going to be a lot of innovation that's exciting that will be more do-it-yourself, do-it-home while more people end up staying at home, at least through 2021, a lot of companies have said people can stay at home and not go back into the offices. So I think there'll be a huge restructuring on real estate and how people work and a lot of innovation that will come as a result of that. Totally. Yeah. And uh, Susan, we got another question from our founding tribe member, Janet. Janet, you want to ask Susan yourself? Mm. Oh, Janet, we couldn't hear you. Maybe put your volume up, Janet. Yeah. Um, Last night when we had a meeting, it was fine. Why it's like it became, okay. Can you, wait, say something, Janet? No, oh. can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. We can ask your question for you if you like. Yeah. Yeah, Jacqueline, you can ask this question. Okay. Um, so this is from Janet. I'm inspired by your focus, attempt, your focus, action to create system change, Susan, yet I often feel that crises created by private sector neglect will always outpace reactive philanthropic efforts. How do you think we can contribute to these systems level changes as participants and consumers? That is a fantastic question. I think that um, obviously you can vote with your pocketbook. Um, but I actually agree. I feel like individual choice is really powerful and you need to have sort of the grassroots and the awareness of consumers to be activists, but you also need corporations to come together. And I'm a, um, an advisor, a mission uh, advisor to Imagine, which is a new company that Paul Pullman and Valerie Keller co-founded. Uh, and their theory of change is the Margaret Mead quote that it only takes a small group of people to create change. And they're working, they helped create the fashion pack with 30 CEOs, uh, with Francois-Henri Pinot and also um, French President Macron. And we're now working on a 
gathering of food system CEOs to look at the food system and ways that they can innovate. And I have to say, it's extremely exciting to see that there are CEOs that are actually, you know, baby boomers that are really wanting to make change and they understand what's at stake. So um, they're the ones uh, that can really create a systemic uh, movement because they have so much power in the supply chain. Um, so I actually think that there is some of that going also in finance. There's a lot of uh, innovation toward uh, ESG and CSR and green finance um, and divestment from you know, fossil fuels. So it, and that's being both um, pressured by stakeholders, but also looking at the economics as well. Um, so that's a great question. I think that you've got to work on both levels. Yes, totally. And uh, um, we still have some time. If anybody have questions, please raise your hand or drop your questions. So before that, I actually have a question myself. <laughs> so Susan, you know, uh, I'm Chinese. I lived in this country for almost uh, 11 years. And how can we get more involved to um, help building the bridge and the trust between China and America. And especially ever since quarantine happened or the pandemic happened, the fashion or retail industry got hugely um, affected here. And for me, I have so many friends who work in fashion retail and I have so many friends who own fashion brands or beauty brands. How can I help them to become more sustainable from um, international bridging level because I have a marketing agency, like Jacqueline has her branding agency, Creative du uh, Duality, and my new marketing, we work with clients from both sides, right? So that would be so beautiful if I can like introduce or help more brands in turn China because right now China went back normal and the consuming power is still there. So if we can help American brands enter the new markets and then we can help US economics um, become better, although it's like the, the time is very uh, tough. So how can we get involved and how can we help? Well, I think it's a really tough question because of what's going on currently. And I know with beauty brands, there's a lot of restrictions and regulations um, and animal testing that's actually part of what has to happen in China. So many brands that don't want to do the animal testing, they have to use a third party. I'm sure you're aware of this. Like there, it's just, it's very complicated. Um, but I think there are ways that um, US brands could obviously you know, have a presence in China, you've got, you know, the different, and you know this better than I, but you've got the JD and you've got the Alibaba Tmall and you've got um, JD Lux, which is, is and both the sort of more luxury parts of those companies are, um, are profiling, you know, my collection of Swarovski and they've done a very good job. And I think the role of the, um, the micro influencer is only going to get more and more um, I know that there's like a, a, a stalling right now because of what's going on with the brands, but I think that people are going to be relying more on sort of digital uh, micro influencers that can get the brand out there. So there's going to be more sort of AI um, uh, and tools of AI that will better predict who will be buying the products that you are creating and manufacturing. So I think being able to find that sweet spot between, you know, which companies are using AI, how to pinpoint the consumers, and then creating um, really good digital content and branding that will meet that, that consumer's interest or, or attract their attention. So I think that's what's going to happen um, in, the, in the interim, um, and that the digital storytelling is going to be the most sort of sticky at the moment because you don't have the malls open and the stores and there's just a slow reopening. Um, so I think it's going to be sort of uh, digital and in-store, like how do you create a better story and then sort of this limited um, ability to bring people in and have like the in-store experience when that happens because I don't think you're going to have these crowds of people and um, obviously the whole infrastructure has uh, gone under 
you know, in terms of bankruptcies. So I think that the smaller companies have more ability to pivot and tell their story, but it's a really tough time for all the brands. And I would say that you and Jacqueline actually have a very good opportunity to work together to try to help uh, many of these brands at this time. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. what's fine right now? We're, yeah. we're fusing the, yeah. the U.S. and China in many ways throughout our, our relationship, friendship, and, and, and partnership and business. So it's been a, a beautiful learning lesson and experience to see truly how two you know, amazing entrepreneurs can come together and make fabulous things happen. And we see that throughout our entire Philly community with a, a wonderful group of women who are very diverse and unique. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that come, come together. That's fantastic. And thank you so much, Sue. We really appreciate you being here today. We appreciate you taking the time to answer all of the questions that we had for you. Um, if anybody has any final questions or thoughts, please feel free to drop them in our chat box now. And we wanna again say a very large thank you to Kate Kelly, our head of partnerships and the producer of this series. Thank you, Kate for all of your hard work. And again, thanking Catherine, our head of house for Feely. We appreciate everything that you do. We have such a great team. And for everyone who tuned in today, and if you liked and enjoyed this conversation, we'd love to have you back for more Feely programming. Feely stands for Tribe. We're New York City's first female executive mastermind. And you can check out all of our programming here. Um, I just dropped the link in our chat box. It's all free programming. We have a full lineup for June and we're going to continue this Resilience to Rise series with SAP every other um, Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. EST. So Summer? Yes. So we're so grateful everyone for being here and especially we're grateful for Susan who gave us uh, her precious time again. And I just dropped Susan's links, her Instagram link, her website link and the Mutants Magazine link. And also if like you have any questions about how to get involved in Philly or how to even lead a session or contribute to a session, feel free to email us. And also we are open uh, our second cohort mastermind application right now. So if anybody is interested in joining us, we have already had amazing interviews, but we still continuously looking for new great members. So if you are interested, also apply to join our masterminds. So everyone, I hope you have a great day, okay? And in two weeks, we have Lisa Bulio. She's the founder of Quest Nutrition Bar who will join us. And she's a self-made billionaire. So come back again. and. Uh, like applause to Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you too. so much. Thank you, You're everybody. Incredible. Thank you, the community. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Everyone, we will send a recap out and we'll make sure you have Susan's information and a contact to her editor in chief, Charlotte, who's absolutely fabulous. So if you'd like to get in contact with them and learn more about how you can get involved or how to potentially pitch your brand to Musings, we'll share that information and keep following Sue and Musings on Instagram. She has fabulous inspirational content. And Susan, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks to your community. And may we all have the resilience to rise together and in community. And thank yes. you for the great work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Everyone you. have a fabulous afternoon. Take care. Love Take you. Take care, everyone. Day.